Thank you, first of all, for having me at Stanford tonight. It's really incredibly exciting. It's an honor. To give a little context to the book, uh, it compares the cult I grew up in to the cult of Hollywood and how it affects your mind in ways you're not aware of. And so a lot of it, it's an autobiography, but it's also interspersed with just it's kind of a think piece. And what I did was use old stories from Hollywood and new stories to kind of just illustrate my points. So with that, I'll read a little bit of Brave. There once was a famous actress named Frances Farmer. She hated everything about her artificial life. She wanted to be free. Frances tried to escape fame and the toxicity of Hollywood's male-dominated world, but the studio had her captured. They took Frances to a mental institution. They locked her up. There was nothing wrong with her mind. She just didn't want to be famous. She screamed, begging for her life. Instead, they took it. They laid her down, restrained her, and shocked her mind with electricity. Shock, 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 over and over. The male powers that be in Hollywood wanted Frances to be a submissive, good little girl and remain so. What they left of her was an empty shell, a husk of a woman. Frances was never Frances again, and all because she didn't want to be sold as entertainment. Very few sex symbols escape Hollywood with their minds intact if they manage to stay alive at all. The streets of Hollywood are paved over the bodies of the vulnerable, the fucked with, the lied to, and the hurt. I know I was almost one of them. You may think that what happens in Hollywood doesn't affect you, but you're wrong. Who do you think is curating your reality? Who is showing you who and what you want to be? I want to have a frank conversation about an inner sickness that I see few, if any, addressing how and why Hollywood creates a fucked up mirror for you to look in how you are seeing yourself through your own eyes, but perhaps not your own mind. Hollywood affects your life in ways you may not even be aware of. In my past of being sold as a product, I have been part of massaging your brain. I wiggled into your mind professionally. I was a cigarette that advertisers told you that you needed. I've been on the other side of the looking glass as well, watching you, studying you, impersonating you. All of us in Hollywood media and advertising do, and you know what? We're really good at it. We've had it drilled into us how best to be marketed to you, how best to be sold to you, how to implant what we want into your brain, into your thoughts, into your wallet. And it works. You're sold a fake reality, all for the rock-bottom price of $14. The men who thought they owned me think that they own you. They're the latest in a long line of myth peddlers from the men behind the Bible to these modern-day content creators. They're mostly self-aggrandizing, egomaniacal abusers of power, and they've never been more dangerous. Few in Hollywood, and no actress that I can recall, has gone rogue. Hollywood operates like the mafia when it comes to protecting its own, especially if your own is a rich white male. Yes, I said it, but here's the thing. It's true. I didn't make it so. It just is. In other news, the sky is blue in Los Angeles today. <laughs> By telling some of my story, I aim to shine a light. For those who think Hollywood is a silly joke, it's not. It's a deadly serious business and one that keeps its winnings. You may think it's as simple as forking over hard-earned cash for a night out at the movies or paying a cable bill to be entertained. And I'm here to tell you the price you are paying is much higher than you know. You're paying with your mind, your behavior, and your patterns things that should have no price tag. The simple fact is that what you've watched and consumed from birth has formed you and continues to form you. Even those who've opted out of its false reality have to stay vigilant to remain free from the lies and the messages that do far more harm than they should because they are insidious and they are everywhere. My life, as you will read, has taken me from one dangerous cult to another, one of the biggest cults of all, Hollywood. I say biggest because short of a nuclear bomb, Hollywood has the farthest reach. Brave is the story of how I fought my way out of these cults and reclaimed my life. I want to help you do the same. I'm going to move. Is it OK? Yeah, I'm going to move up here. I feel a little weird behind the podium. So tonight, I want to talk about moving on, where we go. Uh, so a little bit of background on me. I grew up 
in a religious cult called Children of God. And what that taught me from an early age was that most of us are in cults, but we're not actually aware of the fact that we're in cults. I was really aware of it because it was so intense and the messaging system was so deep and so consistent that I rejected it for what it was at a very early age. They say if you've been in a cult, you have like a 70-something percentile chance of falling into another one, and that's how I feel like I fell into Hollywood. I was discovered, and I was immediately told I had to have long hair, otherwise the men in Hollywood wouldn't want to fuck me. If they didn't want to fuck me, they wouldn't hire me. That was a woman that told me that, a female agent. So I grew my hair long, and it changed fundamentally who I was in a way that I couldn't really quantify at the time, and it took me years to figure out that I was just in the wrong world for me. But while I was in that wrong world and kept away from the world, you know, I mean, we literally pay people to protect us from the public. We employ people to keep everybody away from us. And then we're in this weird, rarefied world that keeps us together, but I was an outcast within that world. So I was really just on my own. And what I did was study people like almost as blocks. And I started realizing that I could say things that move people. And I could start saying things that affected people. And I started realizing I could change the worldwide conversation that we've been having. That globally, I felt like it was time that we talk about things in an adult way. That it was time for the skeletons <laughs> to come out of the closet. For me, my story in the past, uh, I was sexually assaulted at Sundance when I was 21. And it changed the course of who I was. My talk tonight is not all about sexual assault, but it is about encountering hardships in your life that fundamentally change its course. You know, who you are, who you were going to be, it gets stolen from you. And then you have to figure out how to put yourself back together to become the 2.0 version of yourself. And it's not fair that you have to be that 2.0. It's not cool, it's not fun to be stolen and have your life altered irreparably. But there are ways that you can grow, you can rise like a phoenix from those ashes. And I believe and I know we can because I've done it. And I know that there are a lot of young people here tonight who maybe if it's happened to you, it's been more recent than it is for me. And there's still a lot of processing that goes on, and it still takes a really long time to come to terms with what happened to you. And I'm here to say that the shame is not yours. You can give it back. It's nothing you need to hang on to. If someone stole your purse, if someone stole you, it's really the same thing. It's just a diabolical inside job. you know. And it, it does. It kills who you were. And it takes a long time in a lot of ways to get strong enough to kind of almost give birth to the kind of deadness inside of you. But you can be a hell of a 2.0, and I know you can. You know, one of the ways we can move the conversation forward from me to, from the question I get asked a lot, which is where do we go from here? And I think where we go from there is to talk of healing, where we go from there is to talk about trauma and to start understanding trauma more. I think that's something that's not made um, much of an allowance for in the public. We don't get a lot of information about trauma and how it affects us, not just sexually, uh, not just sexual assault trauma, just trauma in, in any of the spectrums, anything that gives us post-traumatic stress disorder. And one of the things I would ask you to do is just to start looking at survivors differently because there's days when you're a victim and there are days when you're a survivor and those days can be really fluid. It can go moment by moment. You never know when something's going to hit you when you're going to feel more like a victim and you never know when you're going to feel free and feel strong and feel more of like the survivor that you are. And I think the public, it would be great if they could make an allowance for people that have come forward, that have spoken up, to have that trauma, to realize that they're not going to be perfect. They're not going to be these perfect beings that operate like puppets, you know, which is largely what we're used to seeing when we see kind of well-known people talk in the public eye. 
We see them answering the same questions over and over. We see them with this kind of polished performance. I didn't really have any of that. Uh, my work with activism, privately I'd been an activist for a long time for LGBTQ rights and women's rights and things like that, but it was behind the scenes. It wasn't time to come forward. Around five years ago, I started kind of grooming the media. I started following people all over the world that were writers at newspapers and, and press outlets. And they looked to see who's verified that's following them. So they would look and they would see that it was me. They never interacted with me and I didn't interact with them, but I started seeing my tweets, things on Facebook, things like that, appearing regularly in, in news around the world. So I started realizing that I could groom them much like a predator grooms a victim. And that sounds really creepy, I know. But it was done, it was like thought grooming. And I thought I will just use their own tactics, you know, the kind of gaslighting that so much of the media does to so many of us in society. I thought I could use their own tactics in reverse. And what that did was lay the groundwork for the New York Times stories and the New Yorker stories that came out. Uh, I helped set the New York Times article up. I was being harassed behind the scenes by a very, very powerful man and all of his henchmen and women. And I didn't want my message to be subverted. And I didn't want to shut up. And I didn't want to stay silent anymore. It was time. So when those articles came out, it was like a massive tidal wave. Uh, I'm sure you guys maybe noticed it was all over the news for a while. Just a little bit. <laughs> But one of the things that came out of that, the good part of it, was people realizing their power, that they no longer had to be silent. Simultaneously, they also didn't have to speak up. It's not on them. You know, you can do that when you want to and if you want to. There's no timeline for that. I felt, for me, you know, and I said this earlier today, but Hollywood people are always accused of having an agenda, and I have met a lot of them and, and frankly have never really seen too much of an agenda. They, you know, the right always paints it like there's this Hollywood coven of people that sit around and like ways we can make everybody have to love gay people, ah, <laughs> you know, things like that. It's not how it works there. It's a lot more old fashioned, it's a lot more insidious and in a lot of ways they can't really see themselves, you know, uh, a lot of Republicans paint Hollywood is these kind of false liberals, and I would say in a lot of ways it's quite true. I think they hide from themselves the fact that they're maybe not truly as liberal as they actually think they are, and that they're a lot more old-fashioned and set in their ways. So I didn't have a lot of support from that arena when I came out, and to this day I don't. That's okay. I had to go it on my own. Me and so many of the other women that came forward it sparked this chain reaction in the world. It showed people all over the world that they can stand, they can rise, they can be counted, that their voice matters. And it's hard. I know that in a lot of ways sometimes, especially during the last couple of years, I was just a walking trigger for people. I remind them of something they don't want to be reminded of and something that's maybe too ugly to even look at on a daily basis. But for me, I was like, let's just have this conversation. Let's be better than who we were meant to be. I think as a society, we're only as sick as our secrets. And if I could shine a light anywhere and bring attention to something that we all know has been going on since the dawn of time, then maybe I could throw a wrench in that wheel. Maybe I could just stop it for a little while and get us to pause and reset and just look at things with different lenses. My goal was not me too. That was something that came out a bit after the New York Times story broke, and that was um, Tarana Burke's hashtag, which gave a lot of people all around the world a way to simply acknowledge me too, me too. Did this happen to you? Yes, me too. My work has always been about wanting to get men and women to see each other as human and not a gender to get them to see each other as whole beings and not as individuals, some more powerless than others, some more powerful than others. If we can understand that power is an illusion, and indeed it is, then we can really see each other as the beings that we're, like who were you before they stole you? Who were you before they told you what you were and how you had to be? You know, I noticed when I came to America when I was 10, 
America seemed very, very dead set on crushing out that which was other. And I counted myself in the other category. I was weird to them. I spoke a different language. I looked funny. I didn't talk like they did, and I didn't act like they did. And it really bothered them. And when I noticed that that was really very much like what was going on in the cult, except for all these people here were saying it's the land of the free. And what I noticed was that it was, in a lot of ways, kind of the land of conformity. <coughs> and I started noticing around five years old with kids when they go to school, that, start, that starts when they get really told what they are as a gender. And that's a lot of times when the creativity gets kind of sucked out from them. It's when the girls start realizing they're girls and they feel less powerful, less viable. And it's when the boys start getting sold this illusion of superiority. This illusion that, yes, you were born in this easy, comfortable chair. You know it's an illusion. I know it's an illusion. You're benefiting from it, so you don't want to get out of that chair. But I'm like, the chair doesn't exist. Get out. Stand up. Be human. Understand that you're no better and no worse than anybody else. And for women, realize you have a seat at that table. Take your power. Take your place there. You know, there's something that's very endemic to American society that I've noticed, and that is how scared people are to stand up and be brave, to stand up and be counted, and to stand up and be like, yeah, you know what, I am different. And you know what, I do have things to say. And you know what, you are going to listen, whether you want to or not. For me personally, it was I endured years of being slandered by the media years of being slut-shamed, years of being put down and painted as an imbalanced, angry, crazy woman just because I made people in power uncomfortable. I don't know about you, but I seem like a pretty easygoing person, don't I? <laughs> don't answer that. <laughs> One of the things I've noticed is that we're all so individualistic, but that it's so hard to be and feel like you can stand in your power as an individual. You know, what would you do if you were at your full capacity? What would you do if you were the best version of who you were and who you are and who you can be? One of the ways I like to do that is to simply pretend in any situation that I'm scared of, which is very often a lot of situations, I think, what would the best version of myself do in this situation? And I'll imitate it until it comes true. And that gives me a road map. And that's been my North Star and what's helped me going from being a homeless teenager to being discovered by Hollywood, to being the girlfriend of a murdered boyfriend, to being assaulted, to being blacklisted, to fighting every day to survive. You know, the, the picture that people paint of Hollywood or people in Hollywood is, you know, just the hand on the hip standing like this for all the cameras. What they don't tell you is that you actually feel like throwing up when you're in that position that you actually feel sick to your stomach for the messaging that you're sending out to other girls or other boys. You know, for, for the boys, your soul is like, come fuck me, big boy. For the girls, it's don't you want to be me? And that was largely how I was sold when I was in Hollywood, you know, in the past. And I felt like I had a lot to make up for. I played a part in that, for sure. This was how I paid my rent. But the messaging system that went out there was something that became bigger and darker than even I was aware of. Uh, and it, it forms so many people's minds. You know, when you sit and you watch television or Netflix or whatever it is, you're sitting there with an open brain. And this stuff gets in there. It seeps in you. You know, all the images you see of the woman with the laundry basket in the movie who never does any laundry that you can see. All the things that you've seen of, you know, the guy. There's a movie called, uh, I can't remember the name of it. It's Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe, the nice guy. And in the opening, and it's just like, ha, 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 funny romp. But if you break it down, the first 10 minutes are a little boy reading a porn magazine. And the next thing you see, so witty, you see a car flying past him with a naked hooker on top of it, or rather a naked porn star. He's like, like this. And so what do we get? We get in the first five minutes of the film, we actually check the box of a naked woman, check that we make fun of her throughout the whole movie for being a whore, check, 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 check. But what is sold to that 10-year-old boy that's playing that role? And what's sold to anybody watching it? This is just commonplace. Oh, Hollywood, there they go again. 
And that's how it's largely viewed. Hollywood gets viewed as if it's this thing that stays very localized, but it doesn't. It goes out to everybody. You know, and the thing is, away from Hollywood, it's just the messaging system for society. So away from that, we have to look at the bigger societal issues, the messages that we get that we're not enough, the messages that we get like when we see somebody who's airbrushed and blow dried that we can't be like them, none of which is true. Uh, I would put forth that you should stop getting blow dries. <laughs> it's really you know, about where do we go from here after the news of the past couple of years and the momentum that was gained I think if we can start seeing that we are free beings with free minds, and we start listing our fears and looking at our life as if it's a tapestry, you know, we look at it like, what is the fabric of our beings? And I make lists regularly. I'm like, these are my belief systems. Where did they come from? Did I get these organically? Are they organic to me, or did I pick them up somewhere else, some, somehow, somewhere along the way, either from Hollywood, from media, from advertising, from my parents, from religious leaders, where did it come from and how do I undo this? That's one of the things I do. Another thing we can do is literally try to be 10% better. That's primarily my message and my goal for everybody, is look at your life where you could be a better human and how we can start seeing each other and treating each other as the great humans that we are Instead of seeing, you know, maybe being a man and looking across at the woman sitting across from you, replace that idea with this is a fully formed human sitting across from me, and vice versa. I think there's so much profound change we can affect just by starting, bless you, to see each other differently, you know, to see who we were before we got stolen. And I think it's really imperative upon all of us to learn how to be better allies to each other, to learn that pain isn't just something that stops and goes away, that it is something that is alive and it can eat you. And we have to figure out how we can stop these things, how we can work on them, how we can be better as compatriots and friends, fellow students. You know, you guys are the ones that are going to be going out there into the world to make a change. You guys are the ones that are going to have to be strong and have to get fierce and have to get loud because we need you right now. We need you now more than ever. You know, things I don't know if you've noticed aren't going so well. <laughs> but they're great simultaneously. So how do we get things to be just that 10% better in society? How can we play a part in that healing? How can we play a part in each other's journey and realize how much we have to give and how much we're allowed to take? You know, we count. We all matter. We do. And I know you can be better, and I know it's scary, but I know you can be free just by being you and being brave. Thank you. Rose, I feel like I feel like the most privileged person because Rose was with us in our reputation management class with JD Schramm and myself. And then she was kind enough to have a special coffee with some lottery winners. And then now this. And with each new presentation that you give, I'm learning something new about you. So while they're collecting questions from everybody, I'll ask you a couple questions. First of all, I just want to ask you about the charity that is up here because um, it's something that you'd like to let everybody be aware of. Yes, it's called the East Los Angeles Women's Center, and it's a really amazing grassroots group of people that have been working with human trafficking survivors and rape survivors, primarily low-income Latinas, but across the board, they, they don't exclude, and they are the only long-term post-rape care in the country that I know of. And they do, uh, they've been around for 40 years. They're completely grassroots. I like to try to work with charities that are not the big, big names, um, but rather the people that you see on the front lines that are really affecting change that I find to be incredibly inspiring and brave. Well, I'll say that I did donate. It's so simple. Oh, it's probably one of the easiest ways. It happens in about a second, so don't hesitate. And thank you for making us aware. Every little bit helps. Yeah. So I don't want to, I know that's, who was here in my class? Was anybody in JD's in my class today? 
Okay, good, because I want to ask a question that I'd love this audience to be aware of. On the cover of your book, there's a picture of you. Oh, it's not up here. I'm sorry, it was in our class. You'll see when you go and buy the book after this. There's a picture of you shaving your hair, and you did mention the hair. Can you tell us what this means to you? The hair for me meant freedom from what I was supposed to look like and supposed to be, and I think it was a direct response to the 20 years earlier, you have to grow your hair out kind of thing. I finally was like, no, I don't. But it took me 20 years to get there, and it was a way of... You know, I, I talk about it in the book. I got asked a lot, did you break up with someone? <laughs> and I was like, finally, I was like, I got really annoyed, and I thought the, the question was really sexist, and I, I was like, that's so stupid. And finally, I realized they were actually right. I just broke up with the idea of what I was supposed to be and what I was supposed to look like, and I just wanted to be free. Has it, was it the first time that you really got to choose for yourself how you want to present to the world? Um, after being absorbed into Hollywood, yes, it was. And granted, I look like a weird egghead, but that's okay. You know, you it's don't. all right. You don't. <laughs> so over the course of the day, I have learned that not only are you an author and an actress, which I know, and an activist and a survivor, but you've made a film, you're a musician, you teach yourself, you're really an autodidact, you read so much, you read so many books, and you're curious about life and art. And I think that a lot of people don't really see you that way. I think they've boxed you in and they don't have. realize all the different levels that there are to you. Well, there was no real room for that. And you, you understand that, I mean, I was in Hollywood when Paris Hilton made a record. I think she just made another one. <laughs> Paris, by the way, is super nice. I'm not slagging Paris. <laughs> uh, sometimes she texts me and I'm always like, Paris Hilton just texted me. It's very funny. Life is funny that way. But um, during that time, while I was an actress, I couldn't do the other disciplines and the things I was learning to master behind the scenes because there was no space for that. If you're an actress, you're treated like you wore a short skirt, you deserved it. That's essentially you're kind of looked down on. And for some reason, singers can be actors, but actors can't be singers. It's like this strange like unwritten rule and Hollywood's filled with all these unwritten rules of things that we have to go by that aren't in fact true that they're all illusions none of these rules actually exist so we don't have to follow them but it is true I do a lot of different disciplines and but that was just to keep that's just who I really am behind the scenes I am an artist and a full-fledged one it was just that when you're boxed into being the girl with the short skirt, you know, there's not a lot of room for artistry. And I couldn't have my work uh, come out while people thought that that's all I was. So now there's stuff coming out. There'll be stuff coming out over the next year, projects and things that I've worked on that I think hopefully will go some way to illustrating, you know, that I'm not just the poster child for sexual assault and that I'm not the poster child for someone who gives a middle finger to Hollywood. It's funny because you do drop a lot of F-bombs, which I appreciate because it's real. <laughs> and um, I said to you at some point today that if you were to say what the reputation of Rose McGowan is, it might be as an angry person who's ready to explode. And after I read your entire book and have heard you and been with you, I have a completely different picture. I look at you as filled with light, of compassion, of kindness, and a real desire to connect to people. And it, it made me sad. As a, you know how you say, I just wish they could see them the way I see them. Yeah. And I can only imagine the struggle to be heard. It's, it's incredibly frustrating when you feel trapped by other people's image of you, but there's nothing you can really do about it, you know? And I'm, I'm sure we've all had moments where it would be like being back in middle school and somebody starting a rumor about you and there's nothing you can do and it's just out there and now you're stuck with this certain legacy that you had nothing to do with that was just this thing that just caught fire. You know, I don't know how many of you have gone through that, but... Um, for me, it was on a global scale, and a lot of the media had a really big 
hand in portraying me as unbalanced and portraying me as angry. And what people don't realize is when I would be tweeting or even writing my book, I, I, I speak with a fairly soft voice. You know, it's not this like ah, hard thing, but if you take just the words and you're so, people are unused to seeing a woman that expresses anger, so it's shocking for a lot of people. They don't realize that you can be angry at 5.02 and at 5.04 you're like, let's go get some Taco Bell. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm going to take some questions from the audience okay. for you. Okay. And thank you, everybody. What is one thing you tell your younger self? Oh, that's a good one. <sighs> Don't eat too much Taco Bell. That too. <laughs> I would tell myself it's going to be exactly like what you think it's going to be like. And before it gets better, it will get worse. But no matter what, you're going to be OK. You know, I think a lot of us, we bend, but we don't have to break. And I think I bent a lot. And I think I would tell my younger self, I don't know what else I would tell myself other than what I told myself at the time, <laughs> which is pull up your bootstraps and march on. Keep going forward no matter what. That's a great message. OK. What responsibilities do you think different activist groups have for supporting each other rather than only focusing on their own specific interests? I think that's a great question. You know, when equal pay for women was voted down on the, it was either the House floor or the Senate floor, and it was about three years ago now, and it was during Obama, and I was wait, I was like, what? That was a vote? I thought it was elective jerk behavior. I didn't think it was sanctioned legally. As it turns out, it is sanctioned legally. And I was waiting for GLAD. I was waiting for the NAACP. I was waiting for anybody to say something. But I, none of these organizations did. And I was like, don't you represent women too? Doesn't this also affect you? And in, in that way, I kind of started thinking like, there's so many people who fought and women specifically for gay rights, I'm like, we need your help. We need help. You know, now's the time. And I think a lot of us, just like I used to counsel like homeless transgender teens at Covenant House, you know, I did this with no cameras and no press on it and, and nothing like that. And I did it for years. And I kind of thought, do I have any stake in this game? No. But yes, because I'm a citizen of the world, of course I have a stake in this game. And I kind of think it would be amazing if the gay organizations came out in support of and against the abortion bills, if, if we started just cross-checking each other and, and helping each other across the aisle, I think that would do a lot. Because some of these organizations have a lot of power, but they stay in their lanes, but, but they don't realize that each of the people within their organization is also affected by these other things that are going on to other groups. You know, I want to help <coughs> just humanity in general. And I, I, think, I think it is incumbent upon us to start, like what the politicians are always saying, reaching across the aisles. Thank you. You kind of touched upon this, Rose, but I'm going to ask this anyway. How do you maintain hope? That's the one thing they haven't taken away from me, hope. And that's what I fought really, really hard to protect. And that was something that I, I just believe that we are better than we know we are. And we can have more beautiful lives and see bigger vistas than we can even imagine right now for ourselves. And so I hope for that. I hope for the day that peace will come to my soul and to others. And I think you keep that little flame inside of you alive and you protect it no matter what because people will try to stamp it out from you. But it's really important that we don't bend to make others feel taller. And it's really important that we protect our own light. It's beautiful. What's been a time you've made a mistake 
in your time as an activist, and what did you learn from it? Well, that's a very good question also. I, tweeting late at night, <laughs> 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 tweeting when mad, <sighs> And it's really hard not to, you know, and I've said some things, I'm like, oh, that could have gone far better, you know, or using the wrong word choice in a situation where it snowballed and you're like, that's not, but I think if we can look at intention, of course I've made mistakes. There's no public person that could stand up to scrutiny, the scrutiny that you get when you're a public figure. You know, I know very few people whose lives could stand up to that scrutiny or whose every single thing they say could be perfect. And I'm not somebody who could and, and can't. And I will make mistakes in the future. But I think it's all about intention. And my intentions are good. I come in peace. You do. You spoke about the high cost of speaking up while doing your work. What does your intimate support system look like? I love that question. Well, I have a great partner who... Um, we met during the height of all the insanity about a little over a year ago, and uh, that's helped. Just good friends, and for me, more than anything, it's been about creating artwork during this period as an antidote to the outside world and, and creating kind of a spiritual haven within that work. So that for me, has been more of a support system than people. People, I was never lucky enough to come from a strong family unit or to come from, you know, I moved 10 times in 11 years growing up, and so it wasn't, I didn't have a long history of, like, having gone to school with the same people or knowing the same people or, you know, I can watch a movie where it's five friends that have known each other for 30 years and, like, I don't know what that's like, but I've always kind of been a solo traveler, and I meet great people and great humans along the way, but as far as a support network, I was pretty much alone. What does a better Hollywood look like? What's the one message you want Hollywood to relay to the world? Ooh, good one. I mean, on a bad day, I'll just say, burn it down and start over. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just try again. Uh, on, a, on a good day, it's about, and I think they're making strides. You know, I think it's not, and I, I grew up in that environment. You know, a lot of people are like, to me, like, you're problematic. I'm like, I'm a 45-year-old white woman from Hollywood. Of course I'm problematic. <laughs> How could I not be problematic? It would be almost impossible not to be. But I think that there's, they're having a come-to-Jesus moment and having to look at ways that diversity isn't a box that they can check off, that, that the world responds when they make something that looks like it looks like. And, but it's still very old-fashioned. It's a very old-fashioned place, you know. Um, I think Hollywood still has a lot of cleaning the closet it has to do, because I still know of a lot of things that are going on that aren't being talked about, but they're not my stories to tell, so I just have to wait. And I think once I can clean out the rot, which, you know, Harvey Weinstein was a huge part of that. So I think that's already helped they didn't clean that out, but that needed to be cleaned out. And I think that's helped a lot of healing already. I hope that it continues. Thank you. How do you find allies within your professional network and convince them of your cause? Well, that's something I haven't been able to do. Uh, I don't have a professional network. It was never like that for me. Um, my rapist bought off journalists. Uh, he would buy their contracts, tell them he was going to turn their articles into a movie, and then say, oh, by the way, if this person's name ever comes up in the press, I want you to savage them. 
And that was done up until six months ago. And so any time I would appear in the press, I would just get decimated. And I couldn't understand. I was like, what did I ever do to these people? Then I read in the New, York, New Yorker article about how he was buying off contracts and paying off journalists to slander me and others um, who never signed non-disclosures or had the potential of upsetting you know, the apple cart. And I certainly was hoping for a lot more from the women and men of Hollywood than wearing black armbands and black dresses to the Oscars, which is absurd. But at the same time, I know these people. They were in my own backyard. They were people that I didn't really network with because a lot of them treated me like I had something they didn't want to catch. And that was because everybody knew what had happened to me. But I was blamed for it. And, but I was still somehow working around the blacklisting. I managed to get on a TV show. I managed to do what I had planned on doing 20 years ago when I said, when you did this to me, if I hear of you doing this to another woman, I will come for you. And I immediately heard of him coming, doing that to somebody else. I was like, so I said about my plan. But during that time, you know, I don't think Hollywood people are known for their bravery, which is a pity because if en masse a lot of them stood up and called things out, they couldn't all be blacklisted. It wouldn't work that way. It would sweep the decks. It would clean it out. But um, I think it is getting a little bit better, and people are feeling a tiny bit braver there. What two things would you recommend doing if you have experienced an acute trauma? Uh, one, I would recommend if you can get to someone that does EMDR. It's a really great uh, therapeutic tool. Um, trauma stays in a particular receptor in your brain. And what it, EMDR does, either with a flashing light bar that goes side to side or you follow a circle or something that takes your eyes like this, while you're thinking about or talking about the trauma, and it utilizes your left and right brain in a way that um, kind of dispels it. So when a trigger happens, it doesn't go to critical mass. That's one good way. Another way, and this is the hardest way, is kind of almost letting go of the person that you were before it happened. Because so much that happens to us when we're traumatized, we just desperately want to go back to being who we were before we were hurt. And it's not an option. And it sucks. And it's not fair. But you know, I would say, like for me, working through all that was like giving birth through a spiky birth canal. And it's giving birth to this kind of dead thing inside of you. And you have to figure out how to be the 2.0 version of yourself. And it's just something that's, that's the only way that in time. And it's really, really hard because you never know with trauma what's going to set it off. Thank you. That was incredible. OK. Thank you, JD. I'm going to switch it a little bit to a light and playful option. OK. What was your favorite memory from the set of Charmed? <laughs> who, are, who are charm fans here? Oh, yeah. Cute. Hi, everybody. <laughs> oh, blessed be. <laughs> My favorite memory was I think I, play, I did an episode where I played the 16 year old version of me <laughs> who lost her parents in a fiery car crash. And I had pretend braces on. That was my favorite episode, I think, that with uh, a black and white episode that I did that kind of was reviving classic film. Um, my favorite memory was just, it was a family environment behind the scenes a lot of the time. And that was really nice. And it was both the regularity of it was really hard for me personally, but also something that I think I needed to learn because I'd never had stability in my life. And so there was stability during that five years. And 
the regularity of people being in my life. It was so strange, but also something that was really a teaching moment for me. Well, that leads to the next question, which is, will you continue acting? Everyone's holding their breath. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I'm not drawn to it. You know, acting for me was a weird day job. It was just something that uh, I really did fall into. I was standing on a street corner crying, and two weeks later I was starring in a movie. A woman came up to me and said, do you want to be an actress? And I was like, I'm crying. <laughs> like, no, I don't want to be an actress. And then, of course, two weeks later I'm starring in the movie. <laughs> but it was because I needed money for rent, and it just kind of snowballed from there. I respect actors and actresses so much because it's actually a very difficult profession and a hard job and one that it requires a lot of self-abuse because your body doesn't know that you're play acting, you know? Um, but as something I'm drawn to, as it's something I need to use to work out something in myself, no, I'm not particularly interested. I would have one more acting question for you. It's on the same card. Who should play you when the film of Brave is made? I don't think they've invented her yet. <laughs> okay. Like, there's a great actress in the 1930s. She'd be a pitch perfect casting, but she's dead. So, <laughs> as far as modern people, I don't know. But I like the idea there's a story in Brave um, from when I was 13, when I was a runaway and became homeless. and was taken in by two um, trans girls and a stripper named Tina. And we had an amazing adventure across the United States. I would turn myself in at police stations and say lie and say I was from another town and they'd buy me a bus ticket to get home. And so I'd run this scam and just crisscross, you know, primarily the West Coast. I was like Huckleberry Finn with like two drag queens in tow. <laughs> we also did drag. We would, I would perform on like little gay nightclub stages primarily and dress like Charlie Chaplin or do like really gender bendy stuff at 13 and, and they taught me. They taught me how to do makeup, they taught me how to do this, that, but it was mostly the camaraderie and the, uh, that craziness. I think that 13 year old year would make a great movie. <laughs> Did you face any resistance or backlash from the media when you came out as non-binary? And did the reaction surprise you, if there was? Um, I guess I'd mostly say non-binary just because I don't know what else to say for someone that doesn't believe in gender. I don't know where that, what that leads me with. Um, and I don't know, if, you know, I was raised for the first 10 years of my life without mirrors. I was raised not as a race and not as a gender. And we were raised, we had blocks on the windows. There was, it was very little um, in Children of God, the group that I grew up in. There was, we were supposed to be raised to be super minds and not selves. And then, then it went to Hollywood and got famous where you're one of those photographed people for a while. So it definitely screws with your head. But the reaction I got was, I mean, I, I don't think it's that groundbreaking anymore or that interesting, really. So it wasn't much of a reaction. So that segued into this next question, which is, how can we recognize when we have fallen into a cult, both literal and figuratively? And what advice do you have to ex-cult members? Yeah, that's a good one. One of the things you can do is if you're in a system that you're supporting that's not supporting you back, you're basically in a cult. If you're, if you're doing things that actively support a system that's not benefiting you and is, is in fact harming you, cults aren't all bad. You know, they're not all bad. I mean, I'm sure some of them are, but there were a lot of positives in the group that I was in. Um, for me, the biggest positive was just the de-emphasis de on self. Um, one of the things that you can get out is starting to understand who you are 
and what makes you you and why you can be great and autonomous and have your own power instead of ceding power to another. And when you're Gaslighting goes a lot of the way into like cult mentality too, you know, how we're massaged into thinking certain ways, how we're massaged into behaving in certain ways. You know, there are a lot of resources if it's like a cult cult to get out of. But, you know, one of the things in, in the cult I grew up in, the word we use for people in society that weren't in the cult were systemites, which is a very chilling word, but also true. And... But one of those things that it does is it holds you, it's you versus everybody else. So if you're in a group that's you versus everybody else, I mean, the collective you, then you might want to look at that as well. Thank you. Do you believe new wave feminism is truly intersectional? This is where I have to plead ignorance. I don't... I get, um, and it's funny that I use the word accused of being a radical feminist a lot. And I'm like, <laughs> I love that face. I'm a feminist because I'm not stupid. It's <laughs> a great quote. But that's about as far as I go in that. Um, I, I didn't go to a liberal arts college or study feminism or... The answer is I hope so. I don't know. I really don't know if it is because I don't. I'm not as educated in feminism as much as probably somebody would think. And maybe I should be more educated, but it tends to me when I don't necessarily recognize myself as woman, I, it's funny to be stuck in that category. But I do think there's always been a lot of problems with feminism in the lack of intersectionality. But I think that's getting better with the recognition that it needs to be more intersectional. And I think in the past, people were doing the best they could within the society that they were living in at the time. And we can't ignore the people that came before us that paved a lot of, a lot of roads for us to walk on and to march on, as we should. I think you answered that beautifully. I hope so. You did. <laughs> this is another big question, which uh -oh. I'd have to give you an award if you have the answer, but what is the future of activism? I know, right? Who is out there who? <laughs> I think, you know, the future of activism, at least as I see it, and this I think is a direct correlation to me and others showing that you can cut off the head of power, that you don't just have to bite at the ankles. I think the future of activism is not just grassroots, but it's really people realizing they can cut the head of the rotten head off the, you know, the corporation, essentially. I think it's now two-pronged. I think it's the top and the bottom working in concert with each other. And, you know, there's people that are grassroots activists doing stuff that I couldn't do and haven't done. But I also know that there's things in my special skill set that they can't do and haven't done. And I think those two can dovetail really nicely. And hopefully that's the future <coughs> of activism is just people that are that do have the microphone to get louder with that microphone and to support all the people that are backing them up behind the scenes. Thank you. How did you reconcile what society expected of you and what you expected of yourself? That's a really good question. I always knew what I was capable of doing and what I am capable of doing both in activism and in art but nobody else seemed to believe that. So for me, it was just keeping, I just knew they were wrong. It's like if people make fun of you at school and you know they're wrong, they're like, you're wrong. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's not gonna be a lonely road and it doesn't mean it's not gonna be hard because it is. But if you can lean into that and embrace the fact that it will be at times a very lonely road for you, 
if you choose this life. And it was for me. Um, but I, I think sometimes people have no choice but to face their destiny and work towards that. So the last question is, what question did we fail to ask you that you want to answer tonight? Why, yes, my favorite color is fluorescent orange. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Thank, Thank you all so much.